Who has ever left a degree as an inheritance for their children? Who has left a piece of paper, a PhD, and says, Who eats a piece of paper? African questions, African solutions. He's back. I'm quite excited because the previous episode went viral. We went international. Till now, I still get clips that get cut up, that get DM'd to me by friends in Europe, by friends in America. And it's created a lot of conversations from all over the world. I'm talking about the previous episode that we had. He's here, looking all presidential. Bishop Joshua Mapong, how are you doing, sir? Yes, sir. <laughs> all is well. All is well in Zmunda. <laughs> Good to see you. Pleasure, pleasure. On top of the world. On top of the world and uh, exciting times. Are you healthy? I'm kicking on all 16 cylinders. On all 16 cylinders. I'm feeling very healthy. Very healthy. Family? It was my birthday, actually, last month. Oh. You, you, this is July, August. Uh, this is, we are now in August. August. Yeah, August. Oh, that's how old I'm getting now. It was, it was last month. Yeah. Oh, happy yeah. belated birthday. Thank you. I turned 54. But I've never understood why we celebrate birthdays every 12 months. When we actually spend nine months in our mother's wombs. So maybe that's, that's what Okay, I'm that's a topic for another day. <laughs> but um, I would like to say, as the Hustlers Corner, we owe you a present. What would you like to have? Man, you gave me some shoes the other time. Yeah. yeah and I'm still enjoying my, my battle shoes. Yeah. So I don't know the present for today, anything that is good. But I think if we can um, put some commercializing around my social media spaces, it is a good present to make this information much more visible and. Um, I've, I've been seeing a lot of um, content on YouTube. Your content has always been out there. Yeah. You have a video or two that go viral pretty much almost every month. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to confirm if it is your YouTube, the Joshua Coates. The Joshua Coates is my. We, okay. we, what we did is that on uh, with the Pan-African Daily TV with Dr. Susan Tata, we had a young man in, in Kenya who then decided to create a page on Facebook where he was just doing quotations. Actually, he started off he did it a few months ago. He's almost sitting on 158,000 plus. So as of last month or so, he created then the YouTube, um, uh, Instagram quotations. But basically, this on quotations. And out of that, we made him actually to publish also a booklet, which would be an ebook on Joshua Coates. So it's like a whole world wit wisdom kind of a compilation of all my quotations that I've always, you know, those reckless quote unquote statements that I say. Which, you know, get yourself two wives. <laughs> Those people get like losing their heads, you yeah. know, and uh, you know, religion is for play to colonization, you know, all those little. And but I think it was smart. Then he would tiptoe through my writings, then extract those quotations, and he has created a page for that. Yeah. But it's all pages. It, it's it's beautiful. I'm glad that he uh, he he is part of your team mm. because the content is amazing. Oh, thank you. I just wanted to congratulate you once again. I'm almost done, Mina, with mine. We're about to get into this work, but let me say. Is it a coincidence that you're in South Africa on the week of BRICS? Are you here for the BRICS summit? We are spiritually driven. We are, we are moving between spaces. And we have elections coming up in Zim. BRICS is cooking here. I would have, if I had it in my way, to actually maybe uh, suspend the BRICS conference right now. Why? Um, the, the BRICS idea has run ahead of the African idea. We are going to be dragged into another spectrum of international participation without national consolidation. So what we have in BRICS is Brazil, Russia, South Africa, India, and, and you know, instead actually of the whole African continent coming up with its, with its currency, then it won't be BRICS. Maybe it must be uh, BRAX, because now Africa is in. Then it's, it's Brazil, which is a continent. It's China, which is a continent. It's Russia and India, which are continents. And then here you pick up a country, South Africa. Don't you find something not mm. gelling nicely there? Mm. Then if we needed the consolidation, the, the, the A part, the BRICS part, the South African part, the S part, must be an A rather than an S. Then Isn't it what, what, what Gaddafi was trying to do? Uh, and that's, what, that's where we're going to go to today. And I think we need to start studying the different breed of polit politicians that are coming into the African space now. We had comrades who went to war to fight and etc. But I think their fighting lacked the economic, technological knowledge as to how are we going to take over the system, run it and manage it. And right now what we are having is a frustration of young people who are equally educated now in the system. But when they go to the political platform, it seems that there's a disjoint 
between a, liber, a, a revolutionary leader who has become a puppet of the same system that he was fighting. And the young people are now coming in and saying, no, man, we need more. We cannot just be coming here as participants. We need to be, we, need, we cannot be referred to when presidents are talking the poorest of the poor, the indigent, the unbankable, the, 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 the people are struggling. We, we're not struggling. Maybe what we need now is participation and ownership of the economy. Because I think that politics is a play field of poor people. Real politics is economics. Those who determine the dollar, those who determine the rand, those who hold the money. Because every gunshot, someone is paying. Someone is in the bank while Africa is sitting in the graveyard burying each other. America and France and Britain are sitting in the banks calculating their spoils of war. And I think the young people are waking up. Though I am passionate enough for the next five years to make sure that their passion must not just become emotional. You know, we must change, we must just change, remove everything, we don't care. You better care. Otherwise, you make the same mistakes the liberation heroes did. To shoot everyone out of the offices and then get in the office and you sit there and all of a sudden you must run a bank now. You must run an insurance company. You must run an IT company. You saw what happened in the post office here. You must now run an institution which you don't have a clue as to how is it working, how was it formed, where are we now, what are the future trends, so that they position the brand. So many of these parastatals, as you know very well in the Southern Africa, they've collapsed. You, they are collapsing. They are collapsing to an extent that they are, they are being sold for a song to those who know what to do with them. So we don't want the young people again to be so frustrated with the old people to an extent that you are coming as young people from Harvard, from Vets, from wherever. You just want to come and flood the offices. You are going to do exactly what your old people have done unless you have a new agenda, a new questioning process and in seeking for those new solutions in Africans. And unfortunately, you guys, your appetite for Western civilization will put you at the back foot of Western development because you don't own those things that you are desiring for. You might have to go back again and become beggars and consumers instead of manufacturers and developers. The China model is the best. Close yourselves, reverse re-engineering, play around new products. I like what you're doing. Play around new products, create new brands, stay with them work with them and own those spaces. And slowly, petroleum, food, clothing, like Wobato, shoes, glasses, cars. And, and when you get to the issue of industrialization, Toyota, BMW, Mercedes-Benz are in South Africa. They've signed treaties with the government that no local car must be produced in the country because we are supplying you with the cars. Who will empower you? Who will employ you? Who will what? So here we are in our own country. Up to now, we can't even come up with one South African car because the government is sleeping in bed with the multinational companies who are producing cars from the country but don't allow local people to produce local brands because these international brands will collapse. These are the policies that you young boys who have gone to school to study law. Go back and find out what kind of treaties are we entangled in with the Oppenheimers, with the Ruperts, with the, with, with the you know, Mercedes-Benz, with the Toyotas, the BMWs, what kind, why are we stuck in, in, in manufacturing when actually we have the resources and the raw materials? So, and, and until we begin to have young people whose minds are keen enough not to be full of anger and temper and emotionalism, but well calibrated to know exactly the problem is here and put their finger on the pulse, your development might actually be slowed down. You might end up committing the same mistakes that we have made in our lives. When you walked in here, I said you look presidential. <laughs> You've got a beret. There was an interesting topic on Twitter the other day, and somebody was saying, it looks like um, all the revolutionaries are beret. Um, they love their berets. Mm. And somebody came up and said, um, a beret is actually a French mm. item. It's a, mm. it's, a, it's a French symbol. Mm. And then it created an interesting conversation. And I just wanted to hear, was this... Um, the, and I love your style because you're always dressed in your own in your own way, you know. The, but the, 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 the color's crazy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but let me ask the question directly. Yeah. yeah. Would Would you run one day for president? Um, I would run for president presidency, but I would rather be a technical kingmaker in terms of adding my value to the system itself and supporting those that are in power. Sometimes I think maybe we all want to become leaders in our own way. And we forget that even those who make leaders are as powerful as those who become leaders themselves. And uh, leadership for me is not a complicated space. Leadership for me, my best model of leadership is Jacob Zuma. You don't need to know anything. 
You don't need to study anything. You don't need to go to school for anything. Just get the people who can do the job to surround you and let them implement. You give the vision and the, and the, and the, and the dream. And I think on the, on, the, on the African space, the presidential concept is, is dimming because of my appetite for the African national space. The African unity, right? Yes. So I, I, I could see myself maybe the, in the near future participating in that space. Okay. Had I it my way, I would be calling Lumumba, I would be calling Gogo Arkana Chihombori, I would be calling Malema, I would be calling you know, other revolutionaries and luminaries around the continent, even in diaspora. And we, form, we begin to formulate for ourselves a liberation organization towards the liberation of the African continent. I would love to participate there because our, our, what we call right now our nations, they are countries. Our real country is Africa. The, the real country we're talking about is Africa. It's one solid block of, of land, but it's just divided by many villages. And right now what we think is African politics. I want to call it village politics because the world is not at a village. The world is at a global space. And I think with this mindset of small little flags and a few little lines of poetry, we call a national anthem. And then each country stands up with a small little flag and say, we are this, you know, we are Basutu, we are Uganda, we are Zimbabweans, we are South Africa. And we cannot, as countries, fight continents. Maybe until that sinks deep, that China has got 1.4 billion people. China lands in Zimbabwe where there are 12 million people. 12 billion, 1.4 billion on 12 million. You can tell me the amount of abuse that will happen in, in those kind of places. Hence the financial muscle, the, the, the military power. Your, your economy is not even a GDP of a village in China. If you just look at it from that way. America can come here anyway in Niger, in Botswana, and etc. Botswana and Niger has 800,000 people. Now 264 million budget people walk into Botswana. Abuse is rife. You are insignificant. Your population, your budgets are insignificant. Cincinnati on its own, it's a whole economy of Botswana. <laughs> Tribalism, how do we get our people to understand that we are one? Oh, that one's a beautiful. How one. do we get them to understand the Berlin Conference, the conference divided us? Let's make money go next year. Mm. Me and you must go to Berlin. Yeah. I want us to have a podcast in the building where the treaty was signed. Mm. And we must just maybe make a statement and declare that treaty null and void. Because there's a concept in, uh, in, in, in African indigenous knowledge system. They call it Mabele Made. Mabele Made means the woman with the big breast, the long breast. So that she, it, it was so long that she could throw her breast across the river. And the children across the river could drink. And those across the river also could drink. It's, it's an idiom. Because while we were coming from Embo, from Central Africa, and from Tanganyika, and from uh, Uganda, on the various movements, women would get pregnant along the way, and some wouldn't be able to cross the river, so they would remain there. So the concept of Mabele Made says, those that are across the river, and those that have remained on the side of the river, you are breastfeeding from the same person, basically. So if you are looking at Chitikulus that are in Angola and in Congo, the Mutimukulus that are in South Africa, it's one tribe, basically. It's one people. All of them are dark. If you have seen the Bunga, it's Gongelengele. Same thing. Of late, we're beginning to see the Malawian Zulus doing their rituals, singing exactly the same as they do in KwaZulu-Natal, as they do in Zambia. And the South Africans cannot even begin to say Mozambique and Zamashangani because who are the Kumalus, the Mtetwas, they're actually the kings of Mozambique who are actually Zulu in, through, and through. The whole concept of Tsonga in Soshangana, Lobengula, Shaka, Mzilikazi, and etc. just tells you the Nguni, Angoni, Angoni, I'm living away from wickedness. Anguni, Angoni. It's a actually Nguni concept flashes through, and then the Shona, the Karangas, become a bridge between Central and Tanganyika, and then the Bandu tribes get into Abyssinia, into Soha, connecting with, with, with uh, Niger on the top side. So, But if you look carefully at our totemic, as we said in the first program with Panwell, if you look at our totemic connections as Africans, you would find actually that these totems are much superior to our surnames because totems are deeper in terms of our identity than our names and surnames are. So if you are a Sbanda, and you, then you are a Banda, then you are a, a, a Tau, then you are a Mtaung, 
then you are Mungonyama, then you are Shumba, then you are so that the lion, that the lion tribe, and you go over, and then you cannot even fail as a Bible to say the lion of the tribe of Judah. Maybe actually Jesus was in Taung himself, according to the scripture. Then you begin to notice that if a Sibanda in South Africa is killing a, a Shumba from Zimbabwe, and the Shumba in Zimbabwe is, is swearing at a Banda from Malawi, and the Banda at Malawi cannot understand the Mgonyama from Kakosa, and yet your, your totem actually says you all come from the same root, the Ziva, the Mlambos, and you fail to see the connectivity of our totemic connectivity, then I can't help you young people. You need to study, then the study of self is far much more superior to the study of books and everything else. Because when you know who you are, where you are coming from, and what you are connected to, you may just find that it's not just about melanin and color, but actually intrinsically by blood. Three, five, six, seven generations we actually want people, and for South Africa in particular, I'll make it clear, for South Africa in particular, it's a crime of the highest sort to look at anyone. Listen to the song of Yuma Sekela. Because 60% of the people who are in of Johannesburg is migrant labor. Mm. Migrant labor. And we say so statistically and honestly. You cannot tell me that two generations later, these fathers came here in the 1940s, 1950s, and 60s. Some of them are still alive. You have already forgotten that your father is from Malawi. You have Roma Kura here. You have Ray Piri here. You have Roma Sekela here. You have Dorit Masuka here. You have Roma Ponga here. You have Bob Piri here. You have Ray Piri. I'm just mentioning but a few. My, my great, 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 great grandfather, the fifth. Hmm. So my father's, father's, father's father. They originate from Swaziland. There you go. That's what I've just found out recently. Yeah. And for you to, to look at South Africa, South Africa is superior to Baswazi, are you not undermining your own grandmother? And you get to the Swazi, you find that Swazi is actually coming from the upper Mozambican side. Because they walked in, found the Magagulas there, and etc. the Jamenis, then run the country, and, and it's another history for, for conversation. But we need a more formal Afro-based academic program then, that then does not celebrate colonial literature with all its fanciness, but a simple piece of work that will say is two tewen ungubani. So I go on my mother's side, I am a Sibanda, on my grandfather's side, I'm a Sibanda, I'm a Shumba, I'm a Mtaung, I'm a Wat, I'm a Wat. That's my, grand, that's my mother's father. Then I go on my grandmother's side, she's a Ziva, she's a Mbezi, she's of the water, she's a Manzi, and etc. Then she's Venda. Then I go on my grandmother, on my father's side, She's Tsonga, she's a Tembe, Bombonambi, the Zebras, Botuve, Mumanjenjenj. I go on my grandfather, on my, on, on my father's side, he's a Shoko, he's a Mkanya, he's a Pirian, etc. So I can actually create the compass for myself. And this is where I stand. So I don't have one totem. I actually have four totems that have come together to make me what I am. And I need to understand what is on my left, that is my grand maternal side, or on my right, my grand paternal side, at the back, my grand paternal side. And in the front, my grand, you know, maternal. So you combine the two grannies and the two grandfathers. And that should be able to give you a compass as a child. So even if you wanted to do your, your traditional stuff, let me not teach you as young people. You don't just get there and say, hey, he must move, and you, you delve into your father's lineage, and you think that you've done the job. No. You stop there and say, what ziva? What tembe? What bonambe? What shumba? What but then that gives you exactly who are you. Mm. And when you connect to the four, then you are able to, to, to access your own DNA and knowledge of where you are coming from. And, and I think if we can work from there, we will be able to look at each other differently. I can never walk into a room and I don't find a relative if I wanted to become more serious. And you just, what's your totem? What's your totem? Oh, my mother's grandmother, my cousin, my uncle's wife is from your tribe, my what? My... And we just find there's a beautiful tapestry of the African continent. Hence, when I'm saying what we are calling countries right now are villages, we need to know that Africa functioned as a, as a village. Embo, embryo, embroidery, where the African knitted gene connects us as one people. Zim elections. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're excited about the elections. We are getting into the uh, polls on... Um, the 23rd of, of August in, in Zimbabwe. 
the beautiful part is that I actually have taken two years of my life in Zim, uh, running around the NDS1 project, which was the National Development Strategy. I refused to campaign with caps and t-shirts. I simply went to the president and I asked him, can you show me your national development plan, that which you plan to do and you have budgeted to, to do. I will then, from my own corner, make a follow-up to find out if what you promised the people is what you are delivering. So, and many people got confused. They said, I'm sympathizing with ZANU-PF, I am what, what of ZANU-PF, I've become a puppet of ZANU-PF. No. What I decided to do was just to become positive for once and populate the social media space with some good stories that are happening so that we can help the perception of the world out there. There are lots of young people who have left the country and felt like things are collapsing. But things are collapsing, that's what you hear on Western media. You get to the country, the road between Bainbridge and Harare, beautiful, tired. We've just started Bulawayo to Vic Falls. The border post out of this world. Two airports are now running. Five dams, it has never happened. Five dams, key, and I've been to each one of them, are completed. The new cities are being built. New parliament is now standing. Mining embargoes and etc. You begin to see IT spaces, new hospitals that are coming up, new factories, foundries for steel, the resurrection of Zisco steel, and beautiful part, we've just met our targets for wheat for the next two years. We're not importing any wheat in the country. We've met the quota. Same thing with maize also. We've met our, our, our quota. In other words, there's enough in the country to supply. The surplus will start exporting. And when you begin to look at these beautiful stories in the backdrop of sanctions, my heart was encouraged to say it cannot always be true, even if your father is a thug. But if he comes home with a loaf of bread and a pint of milk and some cheese and butter, come on, as a child, sit down and say thank you for what is happening and appreciate the good things. And in psychology, people work better with positive reinforcement than always being negative. About and I think our local politics in Zimbabwe had become so polarized and so negative that nothing good can be done. I could hate you, Zimbabwe, but when you do what is right, come on, what do I lose? So the fact that I don't like you does not mean that there's nothing good that can come out of you. Learn to see the positive in each other. And the young people, instead of starting new little things on the side, get into the system, because that's where the money is. That's where the ideas are. That's where the policies are. Not to make noise from outside, whereas the, the ship is here, inside. I made an illustration the other day, and it got people offended. You are sitting in a boat, 30 years late into the, into the ocean, and while you are there, you discover the ship is going in a direction that you don't want. Option number one, kill the driver. Kill the captain. Then the, you put yourself another captain. Does he even know where the ship is? Does he even know where it is going? Option number two, let's all jump out of this old Zanopi of, uh, ship. Let's swim back and start another ad adventure for ourselves. Oh, good luck with the sharks. Let's see how many years it will take you to fly, to swim back there, make another one and come back to where we are. Option number three, all of you stand up and you go to the captain and share your notes. Show your compasses. Compare. Chief, I think the, you're too far to the left, to the north. The south is here. Can we move the ship this way? Which one would be the best option? And for me, the best option was sit down with the captain. Sit down with the captains of the industry. Help them also to see where you want as a citizen the country to go. And so the elections are coming at a very opportune time where the ZANU-PF had done lots of good and quite a number of wrong decisions during the Mugabe era. Based on that, I'm saying that the Mugabe era was very politically aware and conscious in terms of policies, but when it came to development and infrastructure management, actually the system collapsed in the hands of Walker Sukwerez and the guys who sat next to the old men. They were supposed to be young people, but instead of sitting next to the old men to help the country go forward, they started pumping their pockets and filling up their pockets with lots of money. So the system collapsed literally, and we're not, we're not mixing words here. The whole juntas that were sitting around Robert Mugabe, they were actually looting from the system, from the parastatal. They have thousands of farms each and plots and houses, and they're sitting here in, 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 in Da Vinci Square here with penthouses right here. And yet in his own mother's village, there's no bowl of water. And now he wants to become a president, a man like Kasukwere. We, we need to be more respected than that. You can, you, so we, we have a, a generation where we lost almost 30 years of that. And again, Mugabe was duped. 
People don't want to admit to that. The British people, the white people, they are liars. They don't keep their words. They don't keep their words. They said they were going to pay. They refused to pay because they hope that you'll be out of the picture sooner or later. The men did not go. Boom, 25 years later, he's still here. And then they started screwing up the nuts to make sure that he's out of the system. So from the era of the 30 years that we had come from and we had, we had done policy development, land distribution policies and etc. But development, water, sanitation, health, education, etc. Those systems were collapsing in the back. Now when Mnangagwa comes into space, he inherited the legacy of looting. He inherited the legacy of, 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 of party politics. And he had now to prove, otherwise this party was going to collapse in his hands. To say, we are not an opposition party as an PF, but we are the ruling party. We owe it to the people to deliver the services. And when I looked at the NDS1 plan and I said, please, Mr. President, I will work with you. Let's convert what is on paper to what is now on the ground. And I'm glad to see some positive movements in that regard. So the 2023 elections, you don't need to wait for the 24th for the announcement. Let me make an announcement, uh, Honorable uh, uh, Emerson Nambuzum Nangagwa will be president on the 24th of this month and nothing is changing. We are actually not selling Zimbabwe to some small little messianic political party that just is obsessed with, I want to become president, I want to become president. No, it's not about wanting to become president. Anyone can become a president. The question is not what you want to do. The question is how are you going to do that? And I don't find the young men talking a language which gives me a process of technocrats financial institutions, you know, except when I get into power, I'll make a phone call to Biden to remove the sanctions then. So people must suffer and die until you are in power to remove sanctions. So out of the suffering of the people, it must induce them to, to vote for you. I think that this sadistic to the highest order, that I will starve you because I want you to vote for me. I will starve you so that you vote for me. Your, your grandmother will die because no tablets for diabetes. Because I, until I become president, that's going to happen. I wanted to sue him actually at one time. The, the, the other guy stopped me. Because I wanted to walk up to the, to, the, to the police station and say, how many people have died because of the sanctions which you are promoting? That speaks of the patriotic bill which has now been approved in Zimbabwe. Where you cannot, as a citizen, walk up to America and negotiate for sanctions on behalf of a country and remain with your country that is in trouble. The Americans have their own policy like that. The British have their own policy like that. Boom, when Zimbabwe does it also, this is going to come as an oppression of the mean power of the media and freedom of the media. Well, go and say that to America. You also have the patriotic bill there. Go to, go to Britain. In America, you cannot be found speaking to another government. The whole thing about Trump, Hillary Clinton, you were talking to Ukraine, you were talking to Russia, you were talking to what? Why? Because anything you are saying to another country about our country must be patriotic and must go through the system. So America has that policy. When Zimbabwe implemented the same policy to manage these young boys who can, because of political clouds, negotiate for the suffering of the country, and the whole world loses its, 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 its top. The Logan Law, that's what they call it in America, the, 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 the Logan Bill. So we, we cannot wait to be told what to do as Africans. And I think we need to take some of these initiatives and protect our sovereignty and our function as countries. Love and respect to my brother, Hopewell Shinono. He'll say you're talking rubbish. Mm -hmm. This is another opportunity to come here in South Africa and be on Smooth's podcast mm -hmm. to electioneer mm -hmm. for, for ZANU-PF. This is just electioneering. Oh, I respect the gentleman. Um, we are almost age mates. He's got his own uh, opinions. He's got, he's, he's got a history with um, the Zimbabwean government, which I don't have. And in my old age, I don't have to inherit other people's enemies. I don't have to walk around and I'm told, love this one, don't love this one, work with this one, don't work with this one. I think it's, it's an opportune time that anybody who is free in a country can look at the political terrain in a way in which they must look at it. Hope well, Shimono, uh, let me not blackmail him to say the least, but uh, his, his handlers also on the other side, maybe who is sponsoring his bills, who is working in that space, I could have worked with Hopewell, I could have worked with Chamisa, I could have worked with MDC, but I'm, as an old man, I think I have, I'm smart enough also in my own space to say, where can I make the best impact? Do I stand outside and make noise to those that can not make any difference? Do I get closer to where the problem is and be able to give my assistance at that level? So I think we need each other, me and Hopewell, in that light, that he must remain where he is, doing what he is doing, because it tells us 
how far are we from the ideal? I am here on the other side talking about the real. While we are talking about ideals, then we filter those ideals into the national development strategy and say, what is it that the people are complaining as agent? And in the words of Shimono that the hospitals are dilapidated, Sanpif is wasting money, and etc. cetera, da, da, da. Well, and I kept quiet. And then two, three, four months ago, the CCC, which is running Arare, gets a budget. Instead of them fixing the hospitals that they've been talking about for the longest of time, they're fixing a stadium. So who eats soccer? So, and, and, and I wish he can make a comment himself. Because now the, 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 the opposition have a budget. And he has been telling them the agenda of how to spend their budget. Instead of fixing what is the basic fundamental need of the Harare City Council, they've decided to go and do a soccer stadium. And that soccer stadium, we had donated money from one of the business organizations in the country to rebuild the stadium for them with a 15-year lease in the management. They refused the deal. They would rather take that money and rubbish it and call for other monies from somewhere. And now they've looked for money to build a stadium. When they could have accepted this construction and taken that money to other infrastructures. So it's, it's a mixed bag. And I think what we need is not just political slogans. We need people who are able-bodied, mentally able, able, technically able to fix the system. Hence, I always feel like uh, technical departments in any government institutions, be it uh, secretary generals, be it deputy generals, be it permanent secretaries, let's try and depoliticize those offices. Because that's where the intellectual property of the department remains. So when every president comes with his PC, new PS, a new DG, a new director in the department, every five years, you can never have a continuity of program. When you look at Wolf, Fauci, you tell that I worked with, 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 with Bush, uh, junior and senior. I worked with Clinton. I worked with Obama. And now I'm working with Biden. That's a permanent secretary in the Department of Health. So you can make, hold a man accountable for 20 years, if not 30 years, of policy manufacturing in the U.S. government. And it's constant and it is steady. You can come as politicians on the space, but departments in terms of their operations. Because when you look at national development plans, you can't transform a country in five years. Planning on its own could take you three years. Fundraising could take you another year or two. P P BOQs can take another six months. Tendering can take another year. By the time you're implementing the program, it's six, seven years, already asking for the second term. And, and by then, you've already moved this guy, you've brought a new guy who also comes with new ideas. So new ideas. So African parliaments are polluted with new energy, but no continuity of planning. Because each leader who comes in wants his program to shine, and they don't understand infrastructure and political development in the glove of social expansion of infrastructure. If not a walk in the night, that you can wake up and say, oh, I'm going to build a Kuka, Kuka power station, a uranium power station, and I'll be done the next two years. No, it won't happen. There are projects that take five, ten years to happen. Only now can we be talking about Mudupi. Did Mandela not start on Mudupi? <laughs> when was it finished? Now it's functioning. So it, it, you need a forward look, proper strategic planning that is beyond presidential elections and five-year turnaround times. And therefore the, the permanent secretary spaces and technocrats must not be politicized so that the development of the country remains as a wheel that is turning rather than allowing the politician and the development to be in the same blanket that when each one comes, I mean, look at Bomo Kwebana and look at Bomo Donzella, look at those are institutions of power. And if each president is coming with his own prosecutor, his own public, so you, you never have a continuity of, of, of a, sta a stable corner that remains solid to driving the, the judiciary system. I'm using South Africa, for example, the judiciary system that it is constant, it is reliable. You tell me when last did you hear the prosecutor general of America being changed in power, or the one for Britain and et cetera. So, but but we've, in the African politics, we have merged the two. Each leader comes in with his new fraternal outfit, from, from legal, to judges, to directors, to deputy directors, to permanent secretaries, it's a whole new crew. And for five years, let's eat as much as we can, gentlemen. And at the end of the five years, another new crew is coming into the space. So we lack what I might call intellectual uh, transmission or intellectual continuity within our, our development strategy, which then means that the country 
can develop. The hospital that was started to be built, even if a president changes, the project will be finished. So you walk around Africa and find all these half-done projects. Why? Because the leader has now been moved. The, the, the budgets are no longer available. A new person has come in. No, this one is no longer accountable. Go to Zambia, for example. The university was being built there. It's now a, a ghost house. You change the politics, change the, and the project falls to the ground. So this continuity for me speaks to our elections in as much as we want change, but we want continuity, we want stability. We want to have a reliable corner that we know that tomorrow business will be running rather than us starting from scratch. And if young people don't understand this, you postpone your progress with another 10, 15 years. Because for you to master that cycle of project management, you are going to get through some schooling, some learning. And of course, uh, Museveni will be giving you some few tips. The fastest way to develop is to get donor money. And if you must get donor money, then you must adhere to some few other principles that IMF and World Bank work with. So it's not as free money as you think. It comes in with uh, some extra uh, policy management and, uh, you know, military base uh, outlining, you know, cultural transformation and most likely resource donations. And then we'll give you the, the donor money. So you, you, the, the politics of the world is not as friendly as the African youth think. It's the dog eat dog. And those that have money determine the politics. It's elections on Wednesday while we're experiencing BRICS week here in South Africa. It's a Monday today, the 21st of August. Mm. Wednesday, elections in Zimbabwe. What would you like to say to Zimbabweans that are here in South Africa right now? And what would you like to say to the Zimbabweans all over the world? The, the, the Zimbabweans that have traveled outside of the, of the country, I'll put them in two groups. Group number one is what I call economic refugees who have been pushed out of the country because they are qualified, they are trained, and all kudos to Mugabe for giving us a free educational system that allowed us all to study. But the... You, you guys are intelligent, by the way. Oh. You guys are all educated, mm -hmm. very educated. And most uncultured, of course. We, we are British. We, 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 the more educated you become, the, more, the less cultured you become. So with, with this amount of, of development in the academic space that happened, unfortunately, it did not match with the manufacturing and the production industries on the left that would then take these students and swallow them into the system. So you find that academically, we overproduced what our local market could consume. That became a fact. So job competition became very tight. At, at the end of the day, those who had extra skills, extra money, sell a goat, sell a cow, go and get the, another place where those skills can be appreciated. So that's group number one, economic refugees. And of course, some of them would want to blame that movement on the regime that we, we did not have jobs, did not have what, what. But I, I beg to differ. We were educated to work. We we're not educated to start up stuff. So the fact that you finish school as a chemical engineer, all you knew, knew how to do was to write a CV. I hereby, I hereby look for a job as a what? You never thought of that as a chemical engineer. You could go back to the village, find out some active ingredients in, a, in Mshonyana and come up with your own uh, thing for flu and what and what, and package it and sell. You are an engineer for crying out loud. You should be able to convert proper juice into proper juice and put it on the shelves. You should be able to, to, to start using your chemical engineering knowledge in creating brands. No, instead, how beautiful is your CV? I work under pressure. I'm a team player. <laughs> I, 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 I have good attitude and etc. So with the whole country of graduates was walking the streets looking for employment. And employment was saturated. So people ended up leaving the country to come to other countries. I was in Britain myself. I was in the US. I was here in South Africa. So that's group one. Group two are what I might call political refugees who in any event quarreled with the government in whatever way, in oppositions, pro or against, factions and etc. within the party. And then they had to run for their own lives for whatever reason. That could So you'd find that when they are outside here, I want to tell the Zimbabwean community, it is beautiful back home. If you came here as an asylum and you know that you're not an asylum seeker, <laughs> correct that and go back home. The, the, the business back home is booming in a, in, in, a, in, in a nice way. Please, like Chivu Dam, beautiful dam there, beautiful, it looks into the, into the water. Plots that can be done, the hotels that can be done, the highway is now close by there. Reinvest back home, adopt your village.
there's no reason for you coming to South Africa here and they're holding some iPhones and playing on the internet, buying DSTV, when there's not even a borehole at your mother's house. So invest back home. You cannot be here trying to drive cars on higher pages and, and, and trying to look the part in, in Santon and in, in Johannesburg. Invest back home. Because I know wherever you are in Zimbabwe, you don't want to die in those countries. Go and go back to your own country. So the, invest in your village. Look back home. And if need be, come back home. But it's too late to register to vote now. But start collecting your money, whichever country you are in. Hear me in my criminal mind. Go to the banks of those countries and look for a loan in those countries. Use your financial muscle while in that country to get a loan. Take that loan. Five, ten thousand bucks. Go back to Zim, get yourself a mine, build yourself a dam, put some agricultural projects, convert your cash into wealth creation. The time to invest is now. Immediately the sanctions are lifted out of Zimbabwe. You won't afford that country. It will be, it will be a grab dog eat dog. So while you still have opportunities, and some of these guys who are here, Sibu, the painful part. On his father's farm, sitting on a diamond in a gold mine. Like literally, I'm saying this word oh, on a platinum and a lithium mine. On an iron ore, on a copper, on a manganese mine. 60 to 80 percent of Zimbabwe is mineable. On a granite mine for paving and etc. And you are here waiting for tips or five rand. And then they come around, no, but you don't have funds. You don't have funds. You don't need funds because you don't have an idea. Go back there and establish what is there. A good idea, you can walk up to the bank, to the funders, and say, here's what I have. Can you put money into this? So the process of converting our raw materials that we have into business units, that's what's lacking in our academic institutions. We are manufacturing employees. I almost said we're manufacturing fools. We're manufacturing, <laughs> we're manufacturing midgets. We're manufacturing intellectual dwarfs who glorify themselves with the number of certificates on the wall instead of the number of products on the table. So, so our, our, our obsession with how many... So, so which, 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 which graduate school did you go to? Oh, you, and then we, we gloat over this. Who has ever left a degree as an inheritance for their children? Who has left a piece of paper, a PhD, and says, Who eats a piece of paper? So uh, the quality of our learning has not taught us to put our hands, convert those papers into more fire, into cell phones, into cars, into cameras, into clothes, into and, 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 and make the wealth that we need. And so we cannot complain while we're in far countries that the country is not what we're waiting for you. You are there in the countries, in South Africa here, in, the, in Europe, working in those strategic companies, pharmaceuticals, constructions, engineering, hospitals, and etc. And you tell me that with all that knowledge that you have, you can't come back home, come back home and make it good. You can't come back, even if you collect a bit of that information, how to run an old age home if you're in Britain, and come back to Zimbabwe and try and build an old age home. We always say in good English, a man with one eye is a king amongst the blind. So the most small knowledge that you have received from the countries where you are, it's high time you come, you come and bring it here. And this one is for all the, the, the Americans and all the, our brothers who are in the in, in diaspora. Collect your investments. Start looking towards Africa. The American dollar, as we said, is collapsing. It's time we start now focusing at the African continent as the next biggest thing that the world has ever seen. We still host here 90% of the world's reserves and resources in all fraternities. We here, our country is more than 30, this is 30 million watt miles of land and we're only 1.3 billion, the least populated continent on the whole world. And yet people are saying, Africa is overpopulated. Africa is overpopulated. Just shut up a little bit. You don't know what you're talking about. We are only 1.4 billion on a 30 million kilometers of land. China is overpopulated. Look at their population vis-a-vis -vis their land. Look at Europe vis-a-vis -vis their land. In Namibia, for example, you have one of the biggest countries uninhabited. Bushes and sand. Hundreds of kilometers. So how can you be telling us that the United Nations policy of the world is getting overpopulated? We need to reduce Africa contraception, family planning to reduce the population when there is so much land. I mean, just drive out of Ernakhenye for crying out loud. 
Just drive out into Carltonville here. Just drive out into Gezina here on Pumalanga in any direction. Tell me 10 kilometers out of town. What do you see? Land. Multiple, multiple land and land and kilometers and yeah. tens and tens and hundreds of kilometers. Mount Pumalanga in Dragonsburg. It's just land. We own it. Um, shab and um, shab. With no one there, and then someone tells us that we are overpopulated. I mean, some of these, some of these narratives needs to be corrected. It's you overpopulated over there, not us here. And don't make your problem our problem. At the end of the day, you want to reduce us here. Why? Because then you can have more access to our resources, and and then you can benefit your own countries. And Africa, for the longest of time, has become a resource supplier instead of a product supplier, finished product supplier. And until we begin to produce products, we can't talk employment. So our governments, I beg them, our governments, stop politicking. Take it from me. Become a dictator and a rebel. Take the government taxpayers' money. Go to China. Buy factories that manufacture chairs, tables, beds, car parts. Bring those factories here. Go to Rustenburg, go to go Daphne, go and get some iron ore. Pour those things into these casts. Produce final products. You cannot be failed to produce chases for cars. Or just lights. Or handbrakes. <laughs> or skins just for the cars. Or, but, but that's where employment happens. And once employment happens, you don't need to build people out of DP houses. People can build themselves the houses that they want. Because they have access to the economy, and they have access to the bank, and they have access to their own salaries. So the whole economic development must not be a handout kind of a kind of an economy where we're, we're giving you sasa. Next thing, oh, you're queuing for a house. Here's a house. Here's, you're killing people. Who says I want to stay in a one small little one small little room? That's why you find that you can even drive around Johannesburg. People are invading farms just outside Johannesburg. But guess what's painful? Spoo? Ask me what's painful. What's painful? People are invading land. But the size of the land they're invading is equivalent to the mkuku that is in their head. Yeah. They don't invade one hectare. <laughs> they don't invade two hectares and say, hey, my gents, hey. <laughs> Singular. They are all invading mukuku land <laughs> where you can only put two, as a, as a two metal sheets. You, you've already invaded. Might as well just take a bigger you piece of You may as well land. just take it. Because it's enough for everybody. I mean, more Pumalabe, more Pumalabe orange farm across the other day. I had just two on the side of the road <laughs> with my gents. <laughs> now, 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 we are are still invading five meters by two meters. The people burning those things. One leaves their heater on, the whole bush catches fire. <laughs> so, it, so, it, so, it's not even about. And Malema must also start saying these things. And I'm saying so very selectively. You must start saying these things. That if we are going to be taking land, let's not have the mukuku mindset. Let's have the farm mindset, industrial mindset, estate mindset, enclosure accommodation mindset. Because if you can take two, three hectares, for example, and sit on it, by the time it is standardized, you can put some flats, you can put a factory, you can put an industry, you can put some accommodation, you can put a hotel, you can what? But how can you put a hotel in a five meter, in a five meter by two meter? What can you do in that piece of land? So we needed even the mindset. Of the, of the EFF liberation struggle heroes, even the ANC, that stop cutting pieces of mkuku policies into the thinking of the Africans and to think that people have land when they are still living in mkuku. We are going nowhere. We are running in circles, like small little rats that are trapped on a running meal. Let's start thinking, development, ownership. And in that midst of that, we can actually begin to look at estates that must be invaded and owned by black people, and you don't have to apologize for that. Shout out to the Ngonyama Lifestyle Estate that we visit with, Ekasi Noble Property Development. We've got our Noble Property Stockfell, which you can find on www.stockfeller.com. Mm. Crowdfunding platform, we're building our own estate. We're very excited. We're starting to build in a few months time this year in 2023. Wow. How does Zimbabwe look like after the 24th? Zimbabwe, the critical issue we are looking at right now is the standardization of our currency so that finally we can, we can have... Um, people don't want to admit it, but right now we're running on US dollars and zinc, which is $1 equivalent to 16, 17, 18 
brands in the country. So Zimbabwe is getting expensive by the day. So we hope that by the time we come up with our own currency, which they had been talking that they're going to benchmark it on the gold coin, we could begin actually to see the economy moving towards itself and owning its own currency. And we're excited to be looking at new payment structures that BRICS and the war in Russia and Ukraine has actually come as a big blessing to Africa to stop over depending on America, but rather start looking east and other wholesalers of money that can help you to develop. And after the 24th, I, I see a big celebration to start with. It's actually after the 23rd, yeah, yeah. from the 24th, yeah. I see a big celebration. I see the president announcing a new strategy as to where is he taking us in the next five years. I'm seeing it myself walking there and getting NDS too, because now this one we're using it for the elections. After elections, I hope now to start vigorously. We are no longer doing it for election purposes. And this whole idea that you only start working in the communities when elections are coming is not right. For, for, from the 24th, I will personally hold the president accountable to what are you going to be doing between now and the 24th. So I need to collect all the presentations that he did during the elections, the things that he promised during the elections. I'll consolidate that into a document. I'll walk up to the president personally and say, you promised people this and this and this. Can you put timelines and budgets so that I could begin to make a, a proper follow-up to see how is he going to deliver on what he has done. And even for South Africa, this is what we need to do. All the slogans we hear, hey, Viva Comrade, Viva Comrade. At the end of the Viva Comrade, the question is, what have you done with what you promised the people? And, 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 and I heard Ramaphosa, the other excited, he's going to build a stadium for the ladies, for netball, what, what. If you, if you don't have it, don't promise it. Don't lie. Don't, don't, don't say you're going to do it if you're not going to do it. Because it goes on record. And now all the ladies are excited, waiting for, and by the way, he promised the wrong people this time. You don't promise a woman. Hunga <laughs> <laughs> I'll take you for a holiday. Then so he promised the wrong people this time. If you promise a woman something, man, your word is your you are, you are God. Your word is a bond. So, and, I, and I hope you can meet up those promises. So we we begin to see um, as the satellite is up in the country. I'm excited. We have bought our satellite dish, and I hope we can. Con it's, right now, it's I think for security. But I think we'll be able to move over now into digitalization of our media, our TVs, our radios, and above all, the free internet access in the whole country and educational programs and etc. So I think there are lots of systems that are being put into space right now. And the new parliament is, is, is out. I'm excited. And I, I, I'm hoping actually to begin to, to see more of the local products coming into the space. When you walk up into the supermarkets now, it's nice to see made in Honda Valley, made in Chipinge, made in Mtare, made 60% of our shelves right now are full of local products. Even some of the juices that we're coming up with. Baobab, you know baobabs, the baobab fruits, yeah, yeah. They've, powdered, the they've powdered that now into a beautiful yogurt. Nice. We used to drink that when we were still heading cattle. Nice. Now it's on the shelves. Now this for me, is the, this is, this is the, 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 the eat factor, where you're now no longer looking for ingredients from, 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 from France to make a local juice. But you can actually look at your own history and indigenous plants and fruits and convert all those into new beverages, new drinks, new types of clothes, new type of designs. New and, and, and man, I wish one day maybe let's make it happen. Pick up Bobato, yourselves, Bo Lokishi, Bo Vanbani, a nice little team of Zimbabwean, of South African based indigenous business people. And we can actually host you in Zimbabwe, an, an idea exchange. Because if the amount of activity I see in Maboneng, if, if that mindset could move into the Zimbabwean space, we could actually be beginning to look at a total new uh, South African Zimbabwean Sadiq movie, clothing, products, activity that begins to inform our own narrative as a generation. Because we cannot be a generation of employees. We need to leave a legacy for our children. And these are legacy projects for me. And, and, and maybe we can plan outside of this and see how can we organize maybe one of the, maybe next year on the youth month and maybe get a host, get a full plane of South African-based um, entrepreneurs. And we host you in Zimbabwe to interact with our youth there also and exchange some ideas. These products need to be having distributors in Zim who are also benefiting and Woloki, Shi, Wobatu, and because that's how the Nikes and the LSEs and they have grown their brands. They're sitting wherever they are sitting in Germany, in Switzerland, in America, but their products are running everywhere in the world. How do they do that? So and I think the local young businessmen 
needs to understand your idea, you have it, you bring it, you grow it up. When do you expand it? As your own business, if you have money. But if you don't have money, how do you package it and you franchise it? Or how do you create a, a, a warehouse of distribution and have many distributors and marketeers who are running with your product? And So you need to find a solution around the, these many products. Because right now I see there's Lieto, there's Batu, there's D-what-what, there's, there's Trip. There's trip. Yeah. And, and, and no, no, no doubt, all of them are beautiful. But again, we are, we are starting to see a flooding of one market mm. with one product. Mm. So instead of me supporting you, I want to come up with my own. Mm. I want to come up with my own. Then we end up again started pulling each other down and you know, who is going to contaminate the environment. So instead of fighting that, Mozambique is open for business. Swaziland is open for business. Namibia is open for business. Zimbabwe is open for business. Zambia, Uganda, etc. So we need to find how do we now begin to package these brands from where they've been created to where they can be consumed, appreciated. And then we have the economy in our hands. We, we can begin to see the other foreign products in terms of the imports going down as new products are beginning to eat into the market. We don't need to chase away the white man. We just starve him. We just, we just stop buying from him. And we start buying from our own. And we don't have to tell the company to say, please, it's time up now. We can go back home. We can put on our own shoes. We can put on our own clothes. We can eat our own food. I can't wait for a day when I'll have a Zulu breakfast in an African hotel and the English breakfast will be out through the window. I can't, I can't wait. I can't wait. In the whole of Africa, English breakfast, continental, continental. What rubbish is that? So we're looking at moments where we are beginning to eat into these industries in all fraternities and we own our economy so that we can determine our own future. Congratulations to Skywater, the fastest growing water brand in Ghana. We're in negotiations with them. I'm looking forward to visiting your factory, guys. Thank you so much for engaging us as Mofire. We're looking forward to um, doing a deal in Ghana and getting into your territory. Are you seeing sanctions getting lifted from Zimbabwe in the near future? Are you seeing that happen? The, the sanctions for Zimbabwe are deliberately intended to be a deterrent for other African countries, not to tamper with land, not to tamper with multinational companies. So it's not even about Zimbabwe sanctions. It's about keeping a good example to the rest of Africa. That should you try, should you try what Zimbabwe did, then this is what it will do to you. So they're not in a hurry to lift those sanctions. And what makes Zimbabwean sanctions so different, it is that they are part of American policy. It was actually voted as part of the law in America to put Zimbabwe on sanctions. Meaning therefore that to, to, for them to change that law will take more than just, just lifting up the sanctions. But the sanctions have had a downfall in terms of the international investment strategies, in terms of the donor money that is coming to the country. But the advantage of that is that it has made people industrious. It has awoken in the country the spirit of entrepreneurship, where people are now eating into the economy itself, where only the colonial masters used to run. Now we actually have Africans who fully own few banks that are in the country, fully black owned. Few insurance companies, fully black owned. Few hospitals in the country, fully black owned. Fewer suppliers, fully black owned. And construction companies, we've just kicked out Group 5 out of Zimbabwe, which is a South African company, and a multinational company. We don't need them, because now we've built enough capacity to do that. And the Group 5 and other companies have gone outside of the country to promote that those companies that are now running in Zimbabwe must be sanctioned also. So we have some of the members now in, in the construction industry who are now facing sanctions because the Group 5s were excluded from the business in Zimbabwe. But I've never understood white people. That you, you don't like my country, then you rubbish me. And when I make up for the loss to make it for myself, then you blackmail me not to do it for myself. So what do they want exactly? They want to see Africans starving. They want to see the economies collapsing. To, when they've collapsed, then they want to come back again as the saviors of the, of the system. We have seen this cycle repeating itself, and I will just give you a quick summary, repeating itself on the African continent in terms of sanctions. Sanctions are actually more gentle. The real idea is what they did to Gaddafi. It is regime change and take over. It's, it's what they did to Iran. It's kill and take over. And while we're there, we must talk about the coup in Niger. Yeah. And so when you begin to see the, the trend of the colonial system from the butchering of the Sankaras, and the, and the Lumumbas, and the entire war 
that Africa fought. Ethiopia was struggling with the Italians. Mozambique was struggling with the Portuguese and Angola, who were struggling with the Buros and the Englishmen. So is Zimbabwe. And Namibia was struggling with the Germans. And Africa must start looking at it one way. The, the big problem for Africa has been the colonialists, the white men. And the white man is the supplier of weapons. And the black man is the handler of the weapons. So that we have a constant war on the continent being sponsored by IMF and World Bank. And, and by the way, don't even feel bad about Bush and Blair. They are stooges also. Who behind them are the Black Rocks, the, the Rockefellers, the, the, the real owners of the economy who own IMF? The, the, the vanguards, right? Who, yes. Who own World Bank? The Soros, the George Soros, who can decide to put money over there, let's remove him from power. So the government itself also, even if you talk about American government and French government and British government, of course, British is a bit different because the king himself is part of that cartel. So you have this system that is behind the system. who we'll sit around in the evening and they discuss. You've never seen guys like Oppenheimer and Rupert going to vote. Vote for what? Their money does it for them. They don't need to waste their time and walk up to a ballot box and sign for anything and put it in a box. They sit at home and they decide who will be there tomorrow. And I made a comment the other day, which I think will offend many South Africans, that for the first time in South Africans, let's remove stooge leaders. Let's allow those that are running this economy to come to the front and run it themselves. Oppenheimer president, Nick and Rupert, prime minister. Let them run this country and we can hold them accountable to the resources that they're holding in their hands. But for us to be happy with a black face that is hoofing around in the building, yet the real man who is running the business is sitting in the corner, I think we're messing it up altogether. So let's give these guys an opportunity. Maybe it sounds unpopular, but let me say it. And maybe the first one to say it. Let's stop working with ANC or EFF or DA stooges. Let's find the people who are owning the economy to come forward and be accountable to us as a nation as to what are they doing with their resources. Because this whole thing of working, you think you're dealing with America, you think you're dealing with France, but how come we even, tell me, we, even when a president changes, their agenda <laughs> does not change? Why? Because there's a stronger backbone of financial muscle through e IMF, which is managing. The crisis in Zimbabwe came from IMF. Through ASAP, Economic Structural Adjustment System, was a full program that Zimbabwe accepted from the IMF. Where did it lead us? It collapsed the whole economy, closed companies and jobs and etc. And then we ended up again becoming a basket case to go and beg for them to fix the problem that they created. So when you look at the African continent in its totality, struggling constantly to win themselves away from this colonial muscle. Now they come around with a beautiful thing. They're going to teach us democracy. They're going to teach us how to manage ourselves. They're going to, they're going to be showing us how best to run countries. But I, how can you be teaching me democracy when you're the same one who was killing me? How can you be teaching me human rights when you're not practicing the human rights? A sanction is not a crime against humanity. When you refuse people medicines, you refuse them clean water. You look at Niger. You want my minerals. You want my, my uranium. You want my minerals. And then you still want to come and kill me. There are deposits of uranium and radioactive material that France has left lying on the ground. It's a, it's a global cry. No one talks about that. The Chad Dam is drying up. No one is talking about that. The Americans put their base in Niger to manage the ECOWAS. No one is talking about that. The young man comes out, Tory, and says, enough is enough. Let's close this thing up. You want uranium? You're going to put a power station here. Then I can switch it on and switch it off when I want to. That's power for me. And when you begin to look at politics like that, my one statement and comment I would want to pass to Africa, starting off with ECOWAS, this is for Benin, this is for Guinea, Guinea Conakry, this is for Mali, this is Burkina Faso, this is Cameroon, and all of you guys who are in that one belt, as of now, become one country. Consolidate your military power together. The problems of Niger are the problems of Burkina Faso. The problems of Burkina Faso, Faso are the problems of Mali. And they are just transferring the same rotten apples from one country to another. So I would think that these countries that are directly affected, particularly the six countries that have gone through coups, I wish those six army generals can actually come together and create one country.
so far and then chase away the American and the French influence in their own countries. Because that is the problem at the center of it all. America does not want Russia to come in. So they will destabilize the country to make sure that Russia is overstretched in terms of its resources. We now know the war is not about anything. The war is about resources. And again, I say, if Africa is not careful that Americans will give guns to ECOWAS in France, will give guns to ECOWAS, and ECOWAS takes those guns to go and kill people in Niger, we are back to square one, where a black African brother is holding a gun to shoot another African brother based on an American and a Frenchman who is sitting in their countries drinking tea. So while we as Africans are sitting in the graveyard and crying for the passing away of each other, the Americans and the French are at the bank signing checks as to what are the spoils of war. We will be fools as Africans if at this day and age we still don't see the enemy that is standing amongst us in the form of America and France and colonization. In whatever form it comes, unity is our solution. Divided we fall, united we stand. The other day we buried, literally you buried the American dollar yeah. on our previous interview. Yeah. That was a beautiful one. A lot of people loved it. Which brings me to the conversation of BRICS. The BRICS currently is, is, is currency is said to be one dollar is to, I don't know, is it to 55, 14 or 55 50, 50, 50. American, one BRICS dollar to 55 American dollars. To 55 American dollars. Let's talk about that. Imagine. What that means that a South African can fly anywhere they want to fly. That's wealth. The South African can take his children to any institution they want to. We can now explore the world in all its fullness. The only disadvantage is that the Western world will no longer be able to consume our goods. Because they're now becoming too expensive. So what you do in that case, therefore, it is to make sure that you begin to produce what you eat and you eat what you produce. You need to look inward. To make sure that you no longer depend on foreign investments as much as you depend on your own local consumptions. So our tourism needs to be occupied by ourselves because the Germans will not be able to come here. And the Americans won't afford one night in Malanga Hotel. <laughs> because you come there with your thousand dollars and you tell you, no, Mjana, Mjana, you have, you have 15 rand. <laughs> you the roles have been reversed. You, so, so we are looking at this. It, is, it won't be happening overnight. Yeah. But in the next one to two years to three years, you're going to be seeing a slight uh, change where the African governments are beginning to put their reserves into the BRICS dollar. And using the BRICS dollar, which is a clean slate in terms of debt, we have not yet started borrowing into that space. So we are almost having a clean account. from scratch. Mm. So I'm seeing quite a bit of excitement there. And I just hope that our, our leaders will not take that money for self-organization rather than for industry, for mining, for farming, the real infrastructure development projects that will activate the economy into, into an operative that can bring wealth to the Africans. And, 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 and I wish again on the BRICS, policy making must be critical, that any country and any leader who is dealing business with BRICS, that their reserves and their profits and surpluses cannot be kept in India and China, but they must be retained in the country of origin. We need some of those policies so that we don't have African leaders again who begin to grab African money and put it in Swedish banks and in, in, in Netherlands and put the money in, in, in foreign banks. And then you find that we are all, always running in, in circles. So we need some few policies that will safeguard national assets to be utilized within the jurisdiction of where the money was made. Then in that case, then we don't need donor money from, for anything. We don't need donor money because the money that we, we create through the materials that we create in bricks. Bricks must actually come with bricks and then it's on stock exchanges, it's on currencies. And within bricks, if, if even better, if we can have a bricks passport, which speaks to the African passport, then bricks is our international market. And the African passport is our national passport in terms of the country itself. Whereas now you have uh, the, the visas for Europe, you have visas for etc. But if we can create a whole economic hub around bricks, for me that speaks of now a South African student can go and study in Brazil, can go and study in India, can study in Russia within the BRICS space. And our economy is actually functioning there. The businesses we're doing, the trades we're doing, the resources we are doing, the inter-exchanges that we are doing within these countries creates a totally different economic platform that is actually profitable to us. And as such, one of my greatest desires right now with the, particularly the Pan-African space and the diaspora 
is to have direct flights from here to the Caribbean. I've never understood why you must fly through Europe and then you must come down this way. Whereas you can just do a six or seven hours just across the waters here. You are in Caribbean, you are in Jamaica, and etc. But it was intelligent for the European to make sure that the slaves and the diaspora people don't have direct link <laughs> with, the, with the main continent. We should have been having ships from Cape Town every week that are going into the Caribbean and Caribbean back into Africa and, and create even St. Helena. St. Helena is only a few kilometers from here into the sea. But you, you don't have direct communication between Africa and that. And why am I mentioning that diaspora space? You have a group of our own brothers and sisters who are well-educated, who are running systems there, who have been there in the West with experience from America and etc., who could be a very huge resource onto the African continent. Imagine the amount of marriages we can enjoy. Imagine, just imagine the amount of schools. Instead of trying to send our children to Cambridge, we can send them to Kingston University. Those Jamaicans are geniuses in planting marijuana, huh? in making into these herbs, herbal marijuana, and etc. Those technologies are coming here. Lesotho has just approved policies for planting marijuana for medical use. But the technologies of how to do that could just be across the across the water right here. So we, we begin to see the, the cultural exchange. Immeasurable, immeasurable. And the celebration of history. Finally, Africa begins to come together. They necessarily don't all have to come back to Africa, but the fact that now there's a relationship between them and us, our children studying there, their children studying here, we playing sports together, you know, netball, soccer, rugby, and, and begin music exchange. It's, it's, it's immeasurable. And the, 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 the capitalization of our tourism industry becomes actually even another low-hanging fruit that we can benefit from over and above the cultural exchange. So the, the, the diaspora for me, particularly our own melanated brothers and sisters, bring lots of value to the African conversation. And the BRICS gives us the financial platform to begin to move amongst each other. And yes, American dollar, we conducted the funeral and I don't think there will be a resurrection soon unless America can start changing its attitude. America has not been behaving properly. And I'm sorry to say this. A nation like America, which specializes in making guns and bombs to kill other people, cannot be called human beings. Can I say that again? Say it again. Any human being on the face of the earth who spends all his life making guns, bombs and explosives and atomic bombs to exterminate other people and, and, and just wipe out other people. We, we still have simmering of Hiroshima, Nagasaki. We still have Vietnam. We still have tombs and graves all around Africa caused by these guns. And if a country like America, the government like America, cannot see how evil it is at its core, that life, dignity, sovereignty, and respect of other people their lives and their culture, and deem those people as equal to you. You're not better than anybody else. Bloody hell, Americans. You're not better than anybody else. You eat as we do also. You drink as we drink also. You sleep as we sleep also. You get sick as we get sick also. What makes you think that because you're only a flag that is 52 stars, those stars are all our skies out here. And when you have a nation that has lost its ethos, empathy, Ubuntu, the two part, the Bantu. The American white man is not Muntu because they don't have Buntu. They are Into. How can you fail to have passion and you glorify yourself on a capitalistic agenda of collect more, make more, kill as much as you can, switch off there, switch off there until this happens? You're not human. You're not human. I don't even want to discuss and give American government the dignity of humanity. Because all they have done from the time they arrived on the lands of America is inhuman. To date, the Red Indians are still crying. The slaves are still crying. Floyd is still crying. Iraq is still crying. Syria is crying. Afghanistan is crying. Vietnam is crying. Hiroshima, Japan is crying. Ukraine now is crying. And America wants war in every other village except in New York City. Except in Washington, D.C. I wish we could have those long days where soldiers went to war and soldiers killed each other. 
But how come after every war we have more women and children that are dead and soldiers are still walking? Is this about war? Or this is American genocide camouflaged as protection of our interest? Did you hear France talking? Did you hear America talking? We will protect our interests in Niger. Then I ask myself, when did your interests fly from Washington to Niger? Are your interest Nigerians' interest? When did your when did when did your agenda become our agenda? So you begin to see the American inhuman spirit in the way in which they do their business. And I don't blame them. It is the IMF. It is the World Bank. And those two organizations, they neither have a conscience, they neither have a religion, they neither have a heart, their God is currency, and transactions are their worship services. And they will sell profits for lies. Congratulations on the new book, African Questions and African Solutions. Maponga Joshua III, best-selling author of Find Your Truth. He has spent years in the corporate religious and social space, a time that has made him own the title creative powerhouse. There are those who think inside the box and there are those who think outside the box and there are those who break the box and think he is one of those who break the box and think. He lives and breathes change. His dynamic thinking has surely broken social, religious, economic, national boundaries. He is a CEO of the Institute, of the Institute Farmers of Thought, a core business, and consciousness and improve the quality of human experiences that the quantity of days. He is a pragmatic African, act locally as he says it. He plays dozen music instruments. Oh, I didn't know that you play musical instruments. Wonderful. He's an author, best-selling author, life coach, etc. But he's a graduate of Andrews University in Berrien Springs, Michigan in the United States. He holds a degree in philosophy, BA theology, and persona ministries with a variety of outcome-based qualifications from international institutes, such as the ILO, the International Labor Organization. What is this book about? This book is a jungle. It's a jungle of questions. I had intended this book to write this book firstly, and initially as the first book of its kind worldwide, whereby I was going to have a graduate interrogation platform. What do I mean by that? In all the seven fraternities that I talk about, which is the... Oh, okay, let me mention them. Mm. So, I, I, I think we had touched on them on the previous yes. episode, which was great. <clears throat> but let me just um, touch on a little bit of the, the first paragraph of the foreword. To all, to all African writers and scholars, it is time to write and publish African thought, to profess knowledge in the corridors of power. Mm. A stern reminder that here at the farm, farmers, here we don't tick boxes, we identify seeds plant, digest, assimilate, utilize, apply, and harvest. We have problems with religion and the colonial Bible. Is it a correct assessment that our problem is religion, Christianity, and lack of spirituality? The decolonization project needs direction in order to discard twisted narratives and information. We therefore need two. Here are the seven. One, decolonize education. Mm -hmm. Decolonize politics and governance. Mm -hmm. Decolonize economics and business. Mm -hmm. Decolonize culture and lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Decolonize religion, Christianity, Islam, and spirituality. Mm -hmm. Decolonize entertainment, media, and sports. And the seventh one, decolonize health, medicines, and innovation. Mm -hmm. So I, I picked up those seven pillars very, very intently to look at the colonial system and how it has invaded the African uh, space. And if we are going to be talking deconstruction or decolonization project, we needed to understand the, the entire framework. And I've, I've had on many platforms people talking about decolonization, decolonization. It has almost become a cliche. And I said to myself, slightly being an old man, allow me to do that. But okay, I hear you, young man. Can we now put meat to what you're saying so that we demystify this whole concept of we're decolonizing. We're decol and someone asks you, what exactly? <laughs> what are you decolonizing? So then I, I go into depth. And the reason I did this book, uh, the first half of the book, it has nothing to do with answers. Literally, it is asking questions. Mm. So I wanted to write a, a volume of more than 800 pages of questions. Then I pick those seven subjects and I ask questions in each one of them. Mm. But the, the, my publisher said to me, no man, 
it, it, it would be too much of a complex text. So let's do half questions, and then the other half we do what are your possible solutions to some of these questions. So when you say Africa is a dark continent, who said Africa is a dark continent? How much sunlight do we have in Africa? When does the sun set in Africa? Then if it is a dark, dark continent, what is the white man doing in a dark continent? Who switches off the lights of the continent? Is it the light that is outside that is dark or the light inside the house that is dark? It is economic darkness. Is it spiritual darkness? Is it political darkness? When they say we're a dark continent, who said we're a dark continent? So you, you just go on this rampage of unpacking a statement and those cliche statements that are being said about Africa, and then you, you unpack it, whether it is an economic question, political, religious, and this is like, if our medicine is evil, who said it's evil? What is it made out of? What is white medicine made out of? How do you make white medicine? How do you make black medicine? And if this is witchcraft, what is this? And then, and then you just, so, so constantly on the seven, I interrogated them thoroughly. Then it means that if you are a graduate who holds a degree in any one of those spaces, then you come to this book and you pick up your section of questions, and then parallel them up with your book, or juxtapose them to your book, and begin to ask the relevant questions. And you may just find that your next master's or PhD, the most difficult thing in graduate studies, is finding the research question. And I wanted to use this as a, as, as a very academic book of stop writing about economics. Read first the chapter here. And you find 10, 15 pages of economic questions. If you can just answer those questions, you're, you're, you're a doctor already. Agriculture, same thing. Business, same thing. Politics, same thing. Media, sports, same thing. So why are we promoting? I mean, with all due respect, the, the rugby's, etc. Who is this an African game? What, what, how much money goes in here? What are African games? Why is this one more important? Is it because the white people like it? Is it, is it? is it what? Is it accessible to all? Where does it start? Who originates it? What is the version of African rugby? How did we used to play in the past? And etc. And, and and you just go and you, you you begin to find that even our sports needs to be deconstructed. Because here we are sending our children to play these sports, areas we had our old little games there. Two stones, three stones, two, three, two plus three plus four plus five. You know, highly mathematical games that we, we're developing the quality of our minds. Now rather than just, just chasing a skin of a, of a dead ox, they call it soccer. 22 boys who badly need rest, who are being watched by 120 people who who badly need exercise. <laughs> and the one at the end of this sport, who is healthier? The one watching or the one playing? So, and, and again, you, you decon deconstruction for me, even your plate of food must be deconstructed. Even your medicine must be deconstructed and decolonized. So the, the, the colonization project for me says you are using the Western method and solution vis-a-vis -vis the African solution. And, and for me, this is nothing new. It's just a consciousness that... If you, once those questions are in on your on, on your frontal lobe, as you are interacting with the various institutions, in, particularly if you're professional, you can begin to see where where are the areas where we need to start tweaking. I can never understand a woman who is sitting right now as a director of human resource, and she's still giving another woman two months maternity leave, <laughs> and you forget that you need to decolonize even the labor policies. The woman needs six months. She needs one year paternity leave to look after her child. And when she is back, the husband can take another one year. And the two years, and that little child can at least have a parent for the first two years of their lives. These are the kind of policies we want to see being implemented by the educated. But alas, no. This woman walks into the, into the office and she becomes harder than the men that were sitting there before her. Feel sorry for nobody. Brings no mess with her. This is work, my sister. You take it or leave it. And you wonder, what happened to you understanding where the African is and what kind, what sort of decolonization needs to happen from restaurants to clubs to hotels to clothes to pharmacies to universities. It's a project that the entire African continent, all of us as professionals, need to start comprehending and applying our efforts to. Let's go, for instance, on the African questions on land. What is an estate and how do you connect the African children to their estates? How do you give people land under their feet when they don't own the estate between their ears and between their legs? Who is planting the African estate and who is eating from it? Are the graves not the title deeds to our land rights? Where do we get our food? 
if we do not have the access to the land? Where do we bury our loved ones if we do not have the land? Where do we get our herbs and minerals for our tools? Is this not the inheritance that has been given to us by our ancestors? Has the African ever claimed European, Chinese, or American land and proceeded there to wage war to own their land? And then so it continues, the land part. It's a, it, I, there's no program that I would, I would run, even if people can just know me as Mr. Land, I'll be happy. Because until we unpack what land means, we don't own it. We come from it. Our land is us. We are in, it's an integral part of us. All other ministries are a waste of time. There's only one ministry that counts. That's the Ministry of Land. That's where we Minister of Housing. That's Minister of Forestration. That's Minister of Water. That's Minister of Mining. That's Minister of Roads. That's minister, there's no other ministry we can talk about. Minister of Defense. What are you defending? You're defending the piece of land. So without us as Africans understanding the impact of land ownership, we'll waste time doing all other types of politics. But land is the critical part to which our present African governments, they need to start answering that simple question. We never went to war to fight for democracy. We actually taught the white people democracy because during their time, they deprived us of the same democracy. So they cannot teach us about democracy. We went to fight for war. We went to war to fight for land. That's the only reason we went to fight for land. Our dispossessed land, because with land is means of production, means of mining, means of housing, means of water means of land and until we under, we own the land between our two ears we can't own the land underneath our feet and the land between our legs at the end of the day it's mental liberation that must precede land ownership now it continues to ask questions when i get into the side of the solutions what are the solutions about land the political system must deliver on that mandate for a start the community must be going to school right now to get educated, to be equipped to take over those land. I'm saying so very, inten in, in, very, very tactically because it would be dangerous, for example, in South Africa to say we're going to be taking away farms from white people and giving them to the, to the black community. Yeah. But then you need to, to do a proper survey and say what, are the, what is the food consumption of the country? Who, has, who is supplying this, this food to this community? Because if you interrupt the market from production using politics to redistribute land, you might have to go through a recession and lack of food because the people that now have the pieces of land in their hands don't even know how to work the land and make it productive. So I hope that the Department of Agriculture and Land Banks Thank you. should have been involved for the longest of time between 1994 to date that should we say we want to take over land, we know that DJS Bu can, he can do the, the, the millies. This one can do the cabbages. This one can do this. But unfortunately, that knowledge in many cases, particularly in the South African continent, it is still trapped in the, in the, in the colonial, the Africaners and the white farmers. But alas, in Zim, we can gladly say after they were chased away from the country, the environment has changed. People are now able, and by the way, without bragging, Zimbabwe has always been an agricultural, we've been agricultural as a nation. So even the taking away of land did not come as a big, uh, downfall in terms of production. It, the downfall was experienced because of lack of implements and lack of find, finan finances. But when it came to the knowledge of how to plow and plant, any I can plow myself alone. Uh, a plow this side, a whip that side, two cattle in front. I could drive and plow. So we needed to we need to balance land ownership and skills that come to the land. But politics is the bridge that must actually manage that process. Because if we make it too emotional, like in South Africa, 60% of all your dams in South Africa are sitting on white farms. Okay. So I'm not promoting anything. But it means that 60% of the population of South Africa can be killed just by water poisoning on its own. From the same farmers you're trying to take land from. What if they decide to become spiteful and destroy? Do you, have a, do you even have a backup plan to think ahead? So in war, you must think and think ahead. And if you take away those farms and they poison that piece of land, what are you going to do with it? Because there's chemicals right now where you can make the land invalid for the next seven, eight years. You can't produce anything on it. 
So this knowledge of what is it that you want to take away and how are you going to get it back into your hands needs to be understood and intelligence and militarization, military intelligence, because the national security, food is war. Food is war. Because when people are hungry, people know no politics. If you want to change a regime, starve the people. By tomorrow morning, any government cannot stand in front of hungry people. There's no one who can stand. And those that supply the food, they know. If they can just reduce a bit of bread and etc., that you will run to the street. You won't run to the white man who is the farmer. You run to your president. So food is being used as a weapon of war. While you're taking a break and sipping your water, let me get into this side of the solutions part. This book is called African Questions and African Solutions. As you say, the first half of the book asks questions. The second half of the book, just like this part, African Solutions. The beginning of the end. In the beginning was Africa, the cradle of humankind. The mother of all civilization. The history is written in stones throughout the continent and their civilization has been stolen, repackaged, and resold to them as debt, grants, and relief. The rich continent, the breadbasket of the world, turned into a dumping site of toxic waste and was called a third world. And the global world citizens talk about her and none are talking with her. She has remained a subject of study and an object of abuse, firstly by the Arabs, then the Europeans, and then of late the Chinese. We all have one goal, or oh, the all have one goal to take out her irreplaceable resources in exchange for minerals. They give her paper money and use her they use her very gold to back up their currencies. Whoever has gold has wealth, and selling gold is buying poverty and debt. World education, politics, and economics are all abusive to the uncorrupted African landscape and the spirituality. It's so interesting that as I read this book, I can just hear your voice. <laughs> it's crazy. Like, <laughs> 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 I'm, it was coming from him. It was coming from a very beautiful space, mm. in my own spirit, and um, it's, it's, it's a it's it's a it's a clarion call yeah. to a consciousness. And and I've never looked at myself maybe as a teacher. I've just looked at myself as a reminder, because this this information sits with all of us. There's, when you are reading right now, there's nothing that you have read that intrinsically you don't know. Mm. But it's, it's an awakening. Mm. So I, I would want to consider my writing as a, as, as a consciousness writing, just to awaken the spirit of the African child who is already imbued with the same information. Who are you targeting with this book? I'm targeting the youth. I'm targeting the young politicians. I'm targeting the, the, the business community. And my main passion is that as we are beginning to transform our political terrain, we needed the software that could be relevant to the European, American, and Chinese spaces which we are moving into. It would be a waste of time to have our soldiers training in the Karoo, and then they must go and fight in Antarctica. Then their, their training is totally irrelevant to the environment they're going to be. They were training in the desert. Now they're in Iceland, <laughs> where even your uniform, your guns, your survival skills are mismatched. And I feel right now the African child is mismatched for the global space that he must be dealing with. He thinks he's going there as an equal. Meanwhile, he's going there as an abused child who does not even fully comprehend the system that we're moving into. We have taken our children to, to, to Caesar and we are worried why do they come back as Roman. <laughs> so the education that we have and the relevance, of, how do you know that is true? When, you, when, when, you, when, a, when an educated man like myself goes back to the village where he grew up in and the village can no longer relate to me, I can't eat the same food, I can't sleep on the same floor, I can't drink the same water I used to drink in the river, I can't milk the cows, and I, 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 I protect my children from the same environment that brought me up. Then am I adding value here or have I become a nuisance here? So the educated person when they go back to the environment that brought them up, there's actually, a, I've known one mother actually had to go and ask for a neighbor to give the, their son a bed to sleep on because he was coming from, our, from our, a foreign world. He could not sleep on the floor. 
So, but if you can't sleep on the floor, then why did you buy your mother the bed that you can sleep on? It became a nuisance to his own mother. Mm. And, and we come to these rural areas with our cars full of groceries, our yogurts, and our what what. We go to the village, our children eat those yogurts and everything else. When they are finished, we go back to town to where we come from. The question is, what have your children learned? So you, have to, you literally brought your, your KFCs with you. And you protected the children from what made you. And you, you've given them what you never had. But you forget that what made you is, are these values. So most likely you're bringing up your children to become what you don't know. Because you are not able to open that door of learning between your experience, a curse, I forgot I'm a take. I'm an all stars. Just some social senior man, like interesting, and interact them with the community that made you, so that next time you hear them say, "Hey, Antoine, Antoine, I'm born into Enzai." They understand that your environment has made you, and if you don't appreciate what made me, most likely you're going to become something that I don't even know, and something that you don't know also. Integration of information and sharing of experience becomes intimate way of passing on. IP, intellectual information that secures the next generation. And that is the market that you need to give over to your children as part of their estate. I'm looking forward to reading the book. Where do I find it? Is it available now on uh, bookstores in South Africa? Exclusive books, got it. Okay. Uh, take a lot, yes, has got it. Nice. Two days, it will be with you. International people, please put Amazon under pressure. Order as many as you can on Amazon. And I think with matter of time, they will also have it on their, on their, on, on their shelves. But if you are in, uh, I'm, I'm in Kampala next week on the 24th on the, on the Pyramid Pan-African uh, you know, program there. I hope to go and meet uh, Elder Museveni and other people who are within the Uganda space. I've set up a week actually in Uganda uh, with Jaja, one of my spiritual mentors. We're going to be visiting the sacred islands of Sese where humanity is supposed to have started. The bubbling of the River Nile from Lake Victoria we're going to go to Mount Rinzuri, Mount Kenya, and we're going to be exploring the whole Tanganyika area and also moving into the Victoria Islands. And we'll be doing some drumming sessions on the Friday nights. And uh, I just want to immerse myself in the Uganda culture. So I'll be in Uganda for those uh, next seven days and having some time. Then I think I'll proceed to Morocco for my professorship. I've been awarded a professor thing. And uh, then I'll get to Kenya. And then I'm back in the country. So the next two weeks I'll be... I'll go on the road to have a look out there. Um, do you need a, a, a visa to get into Uganda? Ah, yeah. those, are good, those are good countries, man. Yeah, because yeah. I, I know with, uh, with Ghana, you can get visa on arrival. Yeah, if you got but a, I'm from Zimbabwe. If you've got I, a South African passport. I've been there three, four times. I don't have not uh, okay. got a visa or anything. Okay, and then yeah. Uganda? Yeah, same thing, same thing, Uganda. Yeah. I'm suspecting Morocco maybe was slightly Islamic, but I don't think there'll be a problem. Kenya, no need for, no need for a visa. So Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, they've actually created one market now. You don't even need a passport. You can walk around. If you're coming from any of those three countries, you can actually walk with your ID across the whole thing, which I'm looking forward. Botswana, and I'm glad, by the way, Gen President Genkop and Masisi yeah. have opened up Botswana, border Namibia and Botswana. And, and I met up with the President Genkop and just reminded him that you cannot be a liberation leader in your country. When Botswana's and the Khoisan are still killing each other on the borders between Namibia and Kenya. We share the same people. And I'm glad two weeks later, President Genkop flew into Botswana. The meeting took place. I saw news. Boom! On the line. No more need for passports and etc. And Masisi just called our president in Gabe to open up Botswana and Zimbabwe border also. So those conversations are underlined. I hope uh, Elder Hakainde is listening. And I hope also the Malawian and the Swaziland is listening. Lesotho is listening. There must be a time. And if South Africa is scared of the whole of Africa, you can't be scared of Lesotho. You can't be scared of Swazis. You can't be scared of Mozambique and Zimbabweans. Even if we can have a passport that circulates amongst us here yeah, for a start, while we are waiting for, for the Africa Union and the rest, we could begin to think in a similar direction. And South Africa gold is getting low. Zimbabwe is still high. If this gold market must be maintained, then South Africa can actually look at itself as a big brother and create a stock exchange from which it can actually become a hub of mineral exchange within the SADC region. And immediately that is set up properly. The profit is not all for South Africa only. Congo can benefit. Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe can benefit. So we needed maybe a new quality of thinking. I, I, 
I literally had lots of hope in Tate Ramaphosa, but I think he's, 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 he's disembarrassed me, if not disappointed me. That the, the businessman that I I saw in him during the liberations, I thought when he when he gets up there, he will be so eager on, on the African bank, the fully owned South African bank concept, and put his hand into the stock exchange and secure a chunk of that for African businesses and begin to see the participation of real legitimate African business people in the Sadiq region, adding value to the South African space. But alas, he has decided to disappear into Stellenbosch and look after only a small little clique of white people at the sacrifice of the rest of the country, which is a shame. It's good to see you again. Thank you yeah. very much for visiting. I missed you. Great honor. Looking Great forward honor. to engaging. The next engagement, I would have read and finished the book. Congratulations on the book once again. I must sign it for you, by the way. Please, I must please. sign it for you for, please, for honorable DJ Stu. Please, uh, It's another historical one, guys, this one. It's another historical mm. one. Every time when we drop an episode, you know all of our episodes, none of them is, is less than half a million views. All of them. <laughs> ah, thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited for this one. To it know, inspires to, me. To knowledge and power. Nice. Mm. Yeah, What's the day today? 16th. Today is the, you can write 21st of August. 21. Yeah. Beautiful. Congratulations. Man. Congratulations. It's another person. Thanks to you. Enjoy it. And they will also find a title. So you want to be the master. They might find also find your truth, contested ground, shopping skills, and a couple of other titles that I've done. But enjoy that book. I think it will shape your interviews and help you one thing to ask the right question. Mm. Ask the right question. You may get the right answer. I thank you. Thank you, my big brother. Go enjoy Africa and have fun. Wonderful. More fire! <laughs> More fire! More fire. Thank you, guys. I'll see you guys on the next video.